so just a reminder where we're at in the, in the course is that, again, we're going from the bottom, that underlying like disk, and then building up layers on top of that inside of our database management system. And we're doing this because providing an abstraction between the different layers allows us to be more flexible in how we decide we want to build our different components. So right now we're, we're smack dab in the middle and we're talking about access methods. We're talking about how the database system is going to be accessing our underlying tuples. And the, the data structures we're talking about here can be used to, to sort of speed up this access, trying to avoid having to do a complete sequential scan. So as again, a reminder, the, 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 the hash tables and the tree data structures today can be used in different scenarios inside of our database system. So for example, they can be used as to keep track of the internal metadata or information that the database system is using to know where pages are on disk or what transactions are running or who holds what's locked, right? Again, the first project for you guys is building an extendable hash table, which is then used as the page table inside of your buffer pool manager, right? Then there's other things like core data storage, which we'll touch on a little bit today and maybe more in the next class. And this is the, the, the overarching data structure that the system's going to use to actually store, store our tuples. And then there's temporary data structures that the data system builds on the fly as it builds, as it runs queries. And then there are uh, table indexes that it uses for keeping track of, uh, of, of, you know, to quickly identify tuples based on when we execute queries. Right? And so for today, these tree data structures, these are super useful and very common when using for table indexes. You don't see them that often when used for internal metadata. Uh, and and the, again, the reason why is because the hash tables are only going to support equality predicates looking up, you know, things when you have the exact key. The order preserving indexes or trees that we're talking about today, they can be used for range queries. Uh, where you can scan along and find multiple entries within some range. And based on what data structure you're using, you actually can go in both directions, which is kind of nice. Okay? So we didn't really define this before, but we, can, we should define it now of what I mean by an actual table index. Uh, the table index is essentially a, a, a copy or a replica of the, the, of, of the data in a table. And it's going to contain just a subset of the columns that you specify you want to use for your index. And so this is going to allow you to then quickly search and find the thing that you're looking for, right? We said before that our heaps are unordered uh, blocks of pages of tuples, right? So that means if we want to find something on a particular attribute, we have to scan every single page to, and look at every single record to see whether we have the thing that we're looking for. But if we build a table index, that's this auxiliary data structure that can allow us quickly to find just the exact thing we're looking for. And again, the metaphor that people always use is you have your textbook in this class, Right? If you want to find all the places where the word B plus tree exists in the, in, the, in the textbook, literally just scan every single page and try to find it. Of course, that would take you a long time. But instead, you have that glossary in the back where you just go, and if that's in alphabetical order, it allows you to go to find just the, you know, what pages have the, the keyword B plus tree, and then you can jump to those pages. That's essentially what a table index is going to do for us. And as I said before, it doesn't matter whether you're actually using, well, it, it does matter, but like, the, 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 what the database system is going to use on the inside for, your, for the data structure for your index depends on the implementation, and in some cases depends on what hints you tell it. Right? If you tell it you want a B plus tree or you tell it you want a hash index or hash table, it'll choose that. But the really nice thing about indexes uh, that was sometimes overlooked in, in some of the, the NoSQL, NoSQL systems is that, at least in the early days, is that it's the database system's job to ensure that this table index that you're going to build on your table will always be in sync with the actual data table. So it's not like you're building a separate table where you're going to you know, have pointers to the tuples that you want, and it's up to the application to maintain these things. That's actually a design pattern you see show up a lot uh, when people sort of first build you know, simple applications. They end up trying to build their own glossary <coughs> index manually. And you don't need to do that because the database system will, will do this for you. And you can have an arbitrary number of indexes. You can have an arbitrary number of, of columns in there. Um, and the data, system, it's, 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 the data system knows how to keep those things always uh, consistent with each other. So the, the, the thing we'll talk about more on next week is now, uh, 
how the data system is going to actually decide which index to use, if at all, when it wants to process your query. Right? So again, in your application, you just call create index. You say, you know, for this table, create these index on these columns. Uh, and then when you write your SQL queries, you don't not going to, with some SQL queries you can do this, but in general you don't. You don't specify, yeah, you know, any information about what physical index you want to use. You just say, here's my select statement. And then the database system has this thing called the query planner, the optimizer, that can then look at, say, look at my table, look at your query, and say, well, what indexes do I have for this table? Which one would actually be the best one for me to use? And then picks that one. In some types of queries, you actually want to pick multiple indexes. And you actually scan them or probe them in, in, in parallel and then combine their results. But again, you as the application programmer don't have to specify any information about this. And again, I think in MySQL, you can give hints in your SQL query to say, I really want to use this index. Uh, and, and the data system will do that, regardless of whether it's a good idea or not. Uh, and oftentimes in the commercial database systems, they have tools that allow you to extract the query plan for a query, and then you can actually, the DBA can mainly pick what indexes to use, what join orderings to use. And you typically do this if you have a really complex query where the query optimizer just can't figure out a good plan. But in general, we, we, we don't have to, we don't, we don't want to do this because, you know, whether we use, uh, you know, what, regardless of what indexes we have, we don't want to have to maybe change our application. So, Another rookie mistake that people often make uh, when they start managing their database, uh, and this is sort of at the ap application level, is they start adding whatever indexes they, they think they need. Right? They have you know, a bunch of queries, and they pick at the best index for each one of those queries. And typically, this, or you, this is almost always a bad idea because there's this trade-off in the database management system with the storage overhead of all these different indexes, right? Because now those, those, those index pages are now taking, are occupying slots in your buffer pool, or frames in your buffer pool, and that means you can't, you're storing less data from your tables, right? So there's a storage cost to these things, but then there's also now a maintenance cost, because as I said, the database system is gonna keep the index in sync with the underlying table data, so that means that every single time you do an insert, update, or delete to a table, the database system has to go look and say, well, what was this change, what columns did they modify, and what indexes would be affected by them, and it has to go and update all of them. And that, again, if you have a lot of indexes, that's, that becomes really, really expensive. So uh, there's a bunch of research done, uh, we won't talk about it in this class, there's a bunch of research done maybe 15, 20 years ago uh, at Microsoft and a bunch of other companies for coming up with algorithms to automatically select the best indexes. Um, the sort of think of these as sort of advisory tools now. The, you, the DBA gives us some information and the tool spits out, hey, we think you need these indexes or you think you need to drop these indexes. Uh, there's a bunch of research that we're doing here at CMEO, sort of the same thing. But in, in general, you know, this is what you sort of pay a lot of money for DBA to do, to sort of pick what the, what the right number of indexes you actually need. Uh, and actually, well, we can talk about this later on maybe when we talk about OLAP systems, but there's some database systems that actually don't allow you to pick any indexes at all. So Vertica is one of these systems that are designed for doing analytics. They have no notion of B plus trees, at least the last time I checked, uh, and you can't actually call create index. You, they pre-sort all their columns, and that way uh, it's essentially the same thing as an index. Okay, so for today's agenda, we're gonna focus mostly on the B plus tree, because again, that's the most common data structure you'll, you'll ever see inside of a database system for table indexes. Uh, but then I wanna spend time talking about two other alternative data structures, like tree-like structures. Uh, that are less common, um, but have some interesting properties that I think they're worth discussing uh, in this class. But we're mostly gonna focus on the B plus tree again, because this is what you'll be implementing in the, in the second project, and this is what you see most often in, in, in you know, real database management systems. All right, so the first thing I need to sort of address, which is often confusing for people, is uh, this, this, what a B tree is versus a B plus tree versus all these other trees. So there is a specific data structure called a B-tree. Uh, but the problem is it's also generally used as a class of algorithms, a class of data structures called B-trees. So uh, there is an instance of a B-tree. We'll, we'll cover a little bit in, in this lecture. But, but B plus tree is a type of B-tree. And then there's all these other ones. B-link tree, which was developed here at CMU uh, in the 1970s, and the B-star tree. Um, there's a bunch of these other ones. Um, so what's sort of confusing is that 
almost, I almost guarantee you if you have a database system and they say they're using a B tree, they're not. They're using a B plus tree. To the best of my knowledge, when I look at the, 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 the manual for Postgres and I look at the actual, the actual source code, what they're describing is a B plus tree. But what they reference as uh, how they do concurrency control is from a paper that talks about a B tree. Right, this is all stuff, from the, again, from the 1970s. So, again, almost if, 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 if a database system is using their, say they're using a B tree, they're probably using a B plus tree. And I'll explain what that looks like uh, as we go along. And then, but what the sort of the confusing thing is also about the, the, the B plus tree is that the modern version of it that everyone uses uh, borrows bits and pieces of these other ones. So it uses sibling pointers, and that comes from the B link tree, right? Uh, the way it does um, now split to merge comes from the B tree, right? So again, uh, I'll try to use B plus tree uh, throughout this lecture, but again, just be mindful of when someone says they use a B tree, again, Postgres says this. The best of my knowledge, they're actually using a B plus tree. So a B plus tree is a self-balancing tree, or self-balancing tree data structure, right? The B in, 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 in B plus is sensor balanced. Um, and it, this, this is a, a balanced tree that's going to allow for efficient uh, uh, searches, sequential access, insertions, and deletions. And all, your, all these operations will be done in log n time, right? Uh, and it's different than a binary tree that you maybe thought of or maybe learned about in sort of intro CS classes in that the, in a binary tree, for every node, it can only have two children, right? In a B plus tree, you can have an arbitrary number of, of, of children at each, each node. Um, and the reason why people actually uh, use B plus trees is that they're awesome for doing sequential access on, on, on the database. Again, remember I said in the beginning that all these database systems designed in the 1970s and 1980s had to deal with an environment where memory was expensive and very small, so your database was primarily was gonna be, you know, stored on, on disk, and these spinning disk hard drives were much faster if you did sequential access versus sort of random access because there's that arm that's moving around to jump around along the platter. So a B plus tree is actually can be, can be organized on disk very nicely to support sequential page access. Right? And that's why people actually choose to use this. Now, what's actually surprising and what the current research shows is that even if now you have an in-memory database system, the B plus tree is still very, very good. It's still the, actually almost the best one. I'll show some, some, some numbers at the end that we've, we've run. Um, so the B plus tree was originally designed from an era where it's uh, really efficient access for, you know, for, on disk. But the, even now, it actually still, still is actually really important. So the, the, the B plus tree is, 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 is this venerable index that, that, that is not going anywhere. So there is actually no paper, sort of what the confusion is for the B plus tree is that there is no paper that defines the B plus tree, right? What people normally cite is this 1979 paper, which is a survey, uh, and the title of this paper is the ubiquitous B tree, but again, what they're describing is essentially a B plus tree. Um, but what's crazy to think about this is like in 1979, they're talking about this index being already widespread and widely used, right? Uh, but it was probably invented in like the late, or sorry, in early 1970s, like 71, 72, 73. So even after like six or seven years after it was invented, they're saying this thing is so good, it's, it's huge everywhere. So in this particular, this, this paper from 1979, uh, the only citation they have for, for the origin of the B plus tree comes from some IBM tech report where they talk about using a B plus tree to organize uh, their database. <laughs> As I said, there is no, uh, there's no sort of standard B plus tree paper that's the first one you can read. Everyone usually c cites this one. So the, the properties that we're gonna have in our B, B, B plus tree are the following. So we'll define it as an M-way search tree, and M, again, defines the number of uh, branches you can have in a particular node, right? So a binary tree would be a, a two-way tree, but then in the case of a, of a B plus tree, again, it, it's, it's arbitrary. And it's gonna have the following properties. So first is that it's gonna be, we're gonna say it's perfectly balanced, and that means that for every leaf node we have in our, our index, there's always gonna be the same distance to, to, the, to the root of the tree. So that means looking at look any single key, no matter what key it is, will always have the exact same cost. 
Uh, and this makes it very deterministic. It makes it very stable. Uh, and it's, 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 the data system can, can understand, you know, if I'm going to use this index to go find a single key, what the cost will be. Then we're going to have uh, another requirement that says that every inner node other than the root uh, will always have to be at least half full. So you can define this that they say the, the, the number of keys that you can have in, 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 the, in the node always has to be within the half as defined by M. So you can't go less than half, we'll relax that later on, but you, can't go, you don't want to go less than half. And if you do have to go less than half, then you want to merge it from uh, a, another node to combine it together so that it's always balanced. Again, when I say that, we'll relax it later on. Uh, in some actual commercial systems, they don't actually always follow this hard, fast rule. Uh, because sometimes there, it's actually better to delay doing a merge until, uh, until some later point. But I think for, for, the, for the, you guys in the, first, the second project, you just follow this rule that you always have to be at least half full. And then every internode will also have, uh, with k keys, will always have k plus one non-null children. So you have k keys, then you have k plus one pointers to, to children. So just to give a sort of high-level architectural overview of what this looks like. So this is an abstract rep representation of, of a B plus tree. This is not actually how you actually would want to store it in disk or in memory. But for our purposes, it, it'll, it'll serve as an illustration. So the terminology that we want to use is that any node that is not at the very bottom of the tree is considered an inner node. And then we, we designate the guy at the very top as, as the root node. And then the guys at the bottom here are the leaf nodes. So now in the leaf nodes, what you'll see is that we have these pointers now that allow uh, one node to point to its sibling. And then there's a pointer to go in the other direction as well. So this is actually comes from the B-link tree, right? Uh, the, the original B, B, B tree does not have this, this feature. Right? And so what this will allow us to do when we talk about query execution later on is that, say I want to do a range scan to find all the entries greater than three, all the keys greater than three, I can traverse down to get to this, this first node here on the left, and then just scan across the leaf nodes, right, following the pointer to get over, to find all the elements that I'm looking for. Right, and that's another example of having really efficient sequential access for this. So the way to think about these, these, these pointers going from the, the, the inner node down to the, the, its leaf nodes is that the, the the boundary of, of, of what will be stored on one particular side of, of the index is specified by the key in the parent node. So in the parent node here, I have key 5, key 9. So this path here down to this, this, node, this leaf node here will only contain entries or keys where the key value is less than 5. So this makes, again, really efficient for search because if I need to go find entry 3, I first look at 5 in my key and I say, well, I know 3 is less than 5, so I want to follow down that pointer to get down to the entry that I'm looking for. All right? The way the, to think about how I'm representing the, 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 the nodes here is that uh, the, the first little slot here represents the value, which we'll define in the next slide or so, uh, and, then the, and then the thing to the, to the right of it is, is its corresponding key. So if I'm looking for key 1, uh, I would again f start at 5. 1 is less than 5, so I'd follow down. And then I'm at, I'm at the leaf node, and then I find 1, I find my match. And then I know I look to, to the right of it, or the, sorry, the left of it, and that's the, that's the corresponding value that I want. Again, this is not how exactly you would actually really store this in memory or on disk. Uh, but this, this is how people normally represent this in, in, uh, in, in, in textbooks and things like that. So the, the, the nodes in all our B plus tree are essentially going to contain key value pairs. And the keys are always going to, are just the columns that we specify we want to build our index on. Right? So if we, if we have an index called on emails, then the keys will correspond to those, those, the values of those emails. But now the contents of the values in the nodes will differ based on whether it's an inner node or a leaf node, right? So if it's an inner node, then it's just a pointer to uh, another inner node or leaf nodes. But then if it's a leaf node, right, there's nothing below you. You can't, you can't point to other nodes. Uh, so instead, you're, it'll be either the, the, the record ID or the actual tuple contents. And I'll 
to find that in the next slide. But the key thing to point out is that the arrays at every node will always have to be sorted. So because what happens is when you land at a node, you just, essentially, you just do binary search on those keys to see whether you have the thing that you're, you're looking for. Right? Otherwise, you have to do a linear scan to look at all the elements. So there is a uh, you know, slight performance penalty, a performance cost for keeping the arrays always in sorted order. Uh, but this is not, um, it's usually not that, that big of a deal, not, not a major overhead, right? Because going to disk is always the most expensive thing. And then it speeds up during searches because now you can do binary search instead of the linear scan. So it's sort of a one-time cost to keep them sorted, uh, but then you get faster, faster lookups. So as I said before, the, the, and the values, they can be either two different things. So the first, first approach, the first way, to, uh, uh, first way you can design this in your database system is that the values are essentially just record IDs to tuples, right? So again, if you say you have an index on emails, uh, the key would be some, uh, one particular tuple's email, and its value would be the record ID for the tuple that has that particular key. Right? And we said before, the record ID is typically the page, a combination of the page ID and the slot number or the offset in that page. The other approach is to use what are called index organized tables, or, and where you actually end up storing the entire tuple itself in the, in the leaf node as its value. So in these particular data systems, there's no heap at all. You just have the, the, in the, the leave node pages where you're actually storing the tuples. So when you go do your search in your index and you land the leaf node, and that leaf node will have all the data you need for, for that particular tuple. The tricky thing, though, is you can't do this if you have multiple indexes, right? Because otherwise you have multiple copies for the, for the tuple. So typically, this, this second approach is used for the, the primary key, right? And then in the secondary indexes, you just end up storing the, the record ID, or whatever the primary key ID is. So in that case here, so you say you do a secondary key index lookup, you would do the search in the, B, in the B plus tree, you land to the leaf node, you'd get the record ID of the tuple, but then now you've got to need to probe the primary key index on that, using that record ID but then find the entry that, 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 ha that has the actual tuple. So the first approach is used in Postgres and DB2, uh, as well as SQL Server and Oracle. And then the second approach uh, is used in SQLite and MySQL, but it's also used in SQL Server and Oracle. So this is a good example of where the commercial systems provide uh, a bunch of knobs, a bunch of, bunch of things you can modify or tune in your database to do whatever you think it is the best thing for your application. So in Oracle and SQL Server, you can specify that you want to have tuples stored in the unordered heaps, or you can specify that you want them to be uh, index structured or stored in, actual, in the actual indexes themselves. Um, Postgres always uses record IDs, DB2 always uses record IDs, and then SQLite and MySQL are always using the, the tuple data approach. And I think I talked about this before. Uh, in the case of like MySQL, for example, if you don't specify a primary key, then they generate an internal synthetic one as like the record ID or the row ID, right? So let's look now in the case of storing record IDs, what these leaf nodes actually look like. So the, the way to sort of think about it, again, as how most people represent it in, in textbooks, is that you just have this array, a single array inside of your, your, your page, and on, the, on the, the, the far right and the far left, you have some pointers to your, your siblings. And again, the, the, we don't actually store memory pointers and stable store page IDs. Right? Again, this sort of fits in with you, what you guys are doing in your first project because you use these page IDs to then go to the buffer pool manager and say, give me this page, and it gives you back the chunk of memory that has that, and then you can use that to, to find the thing you're looking for. And this is another good example of, in, in the case of B plus trees, and they're designed to be able to be, have things swapped out to disk if need be. Right? You don't have to keep the entire index in memory. Yes? Say it again. So his question is, do you need the offset for these page IDs? Why would you need the offset? Because then otherwise you would basically say you have one page and you would be able to find a node. That's correct, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So his question is, um, yeah, so, so the statement is that the, these, these, these pointers here are, are the page IDs, and typically what happens is the, the size of the, the a single page corresponds to a single node. 
So if you have 4K pages, then your, your B plus tree nodes are always going to be 4K. Right, so the page ID so it just jumps you to some page, and then the system knows that, oh, I'm dealing with a B plus tree node, whether it's a leaf node or inner node, and then knows how to interpret the bytes to find the thing that you're looking for. Okay. So the, and then in, our, in, in this inner array here, we have, uh, uh, we, we have alternating key values, right? So you have key one, and then, then immediately after that, you'll have its corresponding value. Um, you can store it like this. Uh, Others, or again, the, the values could be either pointers or the actual tuple contents. Um, oftentimes, you see things organized like this. Uh, so there's much extra metadata we have to store, like what level we are in, how many free slots we have left in our, in our node. Um, and then we store our, our previous and next page IDs for our siblings. And then we have sort of one array for, the, for all the sorted values, or sorted, sorted keys. And then the another array for the values, and then the offset in the sort of key array corresponds to the offset with its corresponding value in the, in the value array. Um, you can store it in the alternating way. Uh, it, it doesn't, I, I don't think it makes a big, big difference unless you have variable length uh, values with this uh, interleaving, it makes it more tricky, right? Because if you store the keys, the keys are they're always fixed size, and you always know how to jump to exactly where you need to go. But if they're variable size, then that's harder. All right, so I think at this point, it's worth me bringing up now the difference of the, of the, the B tree versus the B plus tree. Right, we'll go through the actual algorithms of how you do insertion and deletion and searches in a B plus tree. But at this point, you understand the basics of a B plus tree. So now the, 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 the only difference of the B tree versus the B plus tree is that in a B tree, the keys and values will actually be stored in the inner nodes. And if a key exists in an inner node, it will not exist on the leaf node. In the B plus tree, the, the, the real keys and the real values are only stored in the leaf nodes. And that means in the inner nodes, what you may end up having is if a, if a key gets deleted, it may actually still exist in the inner node because it's, it's being served as a guidepost to figure out how you go do your splits when you, when you do traversing. But that won't happen in, in, a, in a B tree. In a B tree, it always has, if a key exists, if a key exists in the index, it has to exist in the tree. If it gets deleted, then it's always removed, right? So the, the B tree is more space efficient because keys only appear once, whereas in a B plus tree, the keys can appear multiple times. Uh, but it makes it actually harder to support concurrent access to update these things because now you have to worry about when things get deleted, uh, you have to worry about modifications occurring in both directions of the tree, um, where in the B plus tree, you know that everyone's always going from the top down to make changes to the underlying leaf nodes, right? So this will come up more when we talk about concurrent control for indexes. Uh, but in general, again, the B plus tree is just sort of easier to implement. So this is what I was saying before, that uh, people may say they're using a B tree but in actuality, they're using a B plus tree. When I look at Postgres, to me, it looks like a, a, a B plus tree. And these inner nodes in the B plus tree, are, again, are, are, are sort of the guideposts that allow us to find the thing we're looking for. All right, so now we understand the high level architecture of this, in, of this data structure. Now we want to talk about how we actually modify it, right? Search is pretty straightforward, right? Search is just looking at the, at the keys at whatever level you're at in the tree and then you compare it with the key that you're trying to find, and that tells you whether you go left or right or continue searching in, in, the, in the array. So now we want to talk about how we actually modify it. To do an insert, uh, you basically have a key. You're, you're going to do a search to find where that key should exist. right? And then you want to put it into that, that leaf node uh, in, 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 sort of, in sorted order. But then if the... If you have enough space, if you have enough free slots in that, in that leaf node, then you're done, right? Not, it's, it's pretty, it, you don't have to do anything extra. But then if it's too big, right, if you run out of slots, then now you have to split it. And you're going to split it into uh, two separate nodes. And you're going to move up into the tree the, the, the middle key of that sort of corresponds to where you're doing your split. And this is sort of a recursive operation, because what's going to happen is when you split a leaf node and you push up a now uh, a new key to its parent node, that parent node might get too big too, and now you have to split that. And that pushes something else up, and I have to split that. 
right? This is sort of the self-balancing part, right? By ensuring that you're, you know, you're not overflowing your, 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 your nodes and you're automatically uh, reorganizing, the, reorganizing the, 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 the data structure. So rather than me make a bunch of PowerPoint slides that try to visualize the, 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 what's going on here, I instead actually want to use this visualization tool that somebody developed at uh, University of San Francisco. Um, because it, it, I think it'll make this more clear, right? So this is, if you, if you go to that URL here, I can't see this. Mm. There we go. Right, so if you go to that URL that I showed, uh, that'll, that's the same, same link as this, right? It's just, a, this is a shortener. So, um, do it this way. Right, so what we're going to do is we're basically going to insert a bunch of keys, and then we're going to show how the, the, the tree will, will restructure itself. And it'll appear here at the bottom. Um, so maybe I'll do this. I'll move, move that down. All right, so we'll insert the key three, right? Then it makes, makes a single node, a root node that has an entry. We insert key five, right? It finds the key that it's looking for, then it does the insert. And here also too with these check these uh, radio buttons are you can specify the maximum number of elements, the degrees, the number maximum number of keys that you can have. Right? So if you hit three, then it then it'll do a split. So now let's say I want to insert four. Right? And what's gonna happen here, it's gonna again do the binary search inside of this node, figure out where four should be, insert it, but then recognize that it doesn't have any more space, and now it needs to do a split. And so, as we said, when you do this, when you do the split, it's going to create two new nodes. In this case, here we're the root, so it's going to create two, two, two new leaf nodes, and then it's going to choose the the middle key to move that up to now be the sort of the guidepost key in in the parent node. Right. So we do four. It lands in the middle, but it's too many keys, and now we split, and then four goes up to the top, and then now we have three and four, three, four, three, four, five. Right. Let's say I do, uh, I want to insert two. What should happen if I insert two? Right, you go to the left, right, because two is less than four, then you land on three, then you do a binary search, you recognize that two is less than three, so it should end up on the, on the left of it. All right? Is this clear? The max degree is the maximum number of keys you can have. So you have, if you hit three, then it, it'll do a split. Right. So now if I, if I insert one, again, what will happen is I do my binary search, I would land on, on, on the, the left node here, and then I would recognize that I don't have no more space, and now I have to do a split. So in this case here, what should be, what should be elevated as the, the guidepost above it? Two, correct. All right, and then, right, and then the, what happens on, on the, on the right-hand side? Right, where four and five are at the leaf node, what happens there? Nothing, right? Because at the root node, I still have an extra slot, right? All right, so what it did there, and again, it picked two to split it, and then put one as a separate page, moved four over in the root node, uh, and then made two be the first entry we have on the other side, okay? So let's see whether, I don't think it'll let me do a decimal, but let me start over. Um, we'll do, One start three, five, seven, nine, and then now we'll put six in. Right? So let's say now I want to, oh, I should have put a decimal in, that's all right. Um, let's say I insert eight, right? You do the search on seven, on the, in, the, in the root node, you recognize that eight is larger than seven, so you go down to, 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 the, to, the, to the, the right-hand side, and then you insert seven, 
in between, uh, you start eight in between seven and nine, and then now you need to, to split that, that bottom node because, again, it's, it's run out of slots. So now you'll see the recursive nature of this data structure because what will happen is when I split this, this, this leaf node here with seven and nine, and now I'm going to create two additional leaf nodes, but now I need to have four pointers in my, in my root node, but I can't because I already have three, and three, three is the max that I can have. So now you have to start recursively uh, doing splits and reorganizing everything, right? See? So is, it, is, it, is this clear? Insertion, if you run out of space, you just split. And if you may have to do this recursively and go up the tree and keep, and keep splitting. Yes? Yes, so his question is, uh, does the node have to be half full? Is that the floor or the ceiling? Uh, I think you usually do this, the floor, yes. Yeah. All right. Um, OK. So now to do deletes, again, you, you do your lookup starting at the root. You find the entry that, that you're looking for that you want to delete. If it's not there, right, you're done. You don't have to do anything. That's obvious. Uh, but now you're going to go ahead and delete it. And if you have at least half full, then you're done, right, because you know that you don't need to rebalance. But if you have, uh, if, if, if deleting that entry now puts you below the half, halfway threshold, you actually have two choices. Uh, the first choice is that you, want, you can try to, to steal an entry from a sibling and, and move it over to you so that you remain balanced. You may have to change the, the, the parent node to now have the correct uh, uh, you know, boundaries to go with left or right. Um, but if you can't do that, then you have to pick a sibling and end up merging with it. And now there are uh, performance trade-offs you know, for different instances of a B plus tree uh, where choosing the left one versus the right one can have different, different outcomes. Uh, typically, though, uh, you know, most times in like a textbook or something like that, or, or in a lot of systems, you just choose one. You, you always choose left. You always choose right. You don't try to maybe be a bit more intelligent, right? So then, what will happen is when if you do a merge, then you may have to, you, you'll end up deleting a uh, an entry in your in your parent because now you're pointing to to one less less uh, one less uh, leaf node below you. All right, so let's go back to our, our, our little thing here, right? So let's say here I, delete, I want to delete six, right? That is probably fine. Right? So again, I'll start at the leaf node. Uh, I'll go down to there, to there, and then I can go ahead and delete six, right? And this is okay because uh, we're still uh, half full. Right? We have two entries, we ha we're at half, halfway point. But now let's say I delete, try to delete this eight here, right? It goes down, finds eight, jumps here, goes ahead and delete, and then we're still half full, so th that's okay. So this is, a great, this is a great illustration of what I was saying before about the difference between a B plus tree or a B tree, because I deleted key six and I deleted key eight, but... Uh, Actually, no, they elevated up there. That's a better example. Sorry. Um, you could still actually have, have them have deleted or have them, have them missing or have, have, them not ex have them still exist in here. So let's say if I try this. If I assert 10, right, it'll land in the corner. Now I try to delete 9. All right, it's, all right. it's too, you don't have to do that, but they're doing it, uh, right? Because it's, it's no, it's still correct, right? Because if nine was still there, nine would still be, uh, or ten would still be greater than nine, so it's still correct to go over there. 
I don't know why they're doing that, but that's fine. All right. Um, let me see if I can insert some stuff and ha have it show you where it actually does the uh, coalescing. Well, I'll just delete 10, right? So you go down and delete 10, and it'll, it looks, it'll look, look at its sibling 7 and recognize it can't steal anything from there to borrow it, so then it has to restructure everything. Right? <laughs> really? <laughs> you, got, you guys are, are easily excited. Uh, okay? So uh, I think we put maybe max degree four. We can get it to actually. Um, and let me speed up the animation too. Ah, sorry. So insert uh, one, three, five, seven, All right, so let's, what we'll do here, we're going to delete seven. That's probably, actually, no, sorry, let's delete three. And what will happen is the, the, the index should recognize that, again, this thing is less than half full, and this guy is more than half full, so we can steal five and move it over there, but that means we'll have to update the parent pointer. This should work. <laughs> All right. Always test your demos before you do them. Uh, six. Okay, there's nothing, there's nothing to delete. Yeah. I'll add six, and then we have to do a split, reorganize. Um, maybe try to delete, delete five. <laughs> That's fine. Or delete <coughs> six. There you go, right? So recognize that it, that, that middle guy was empty, so uh, I wanted to, rather than just doing another, another merging, then if I just moved it over, then I don't have to do major restructuring. Okay? So again, the, the, the link will be in the slides for this um, uh, here if you want to play around with it as, as you're building your, your project. So any questions about inserts or deletes? Any questions about merging or splitting? Yes? So in this demo, the, um, the, the max factor of four can have up to three elements in there. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so in practice, uh, typically what happens is, people have done some measurements on this, uh, the typical fill factor you see, meaning how full are, are, the, uh, are the actual leaf, uh, the, the nodes in your index, right, because you can have empty slots. Typically, they are about 67 to 69% full. And the fan out is the how wide are, is, is, is the leaf node here. Um, in terms of capacity, uh, if you have a height of four, I mean, you have four levels in your, in your index, you can have 300 million different, different entries with a height of uh, three, then you can have um, uh, 2.4 million entries. And so the way to sort of think about, um, in the context of memory, the, you almost always want to have your indexes be stored entirely in main memory, right? Because you want to be, and some, some things we'll look at later on, for some queries, actually, you can actually, uh, do all the processing just based on the indexes without having ever actually look at the real data, right? If I wanted to do a count and say, find me all, count me all the number of entries where the key is greater than five, I don't need to look at the actual tuples to do that count. I just look at my index, count the number of things I find, and then I'm done, right? So typically the database management system will try, will prefer to keep indexes, pa index pages in memory than, uh, than, than tuple pages. And this is sort of part of the, the sort of complex uh, you know, buffer pool replacement policy that they'll specify of like recognizing that some pages are more important than, than others. And so almost always you will, like at the very least if you can't keep the entire index in memory, you always want to keep the root node in memory, right? 
All right, and if you have an 8 kilobyte page size or uh, 16 kilobyte in MySQL or 4 kilobyte in, in the other systems, then that's, that's trivial to do that. Um, and often what happens in the case is, in, oh, in my example, say I just kept inserting entries in, in sort of sequential order, right? You see this all the time if you use an order increment key because you insert one, two, three, four, five, six, right, in that order. And that means all your inserts are basically hitting the, the, the right side of the tree. So there, you always want to keep at least the right side of the tree in memory, and who cares if the left side gets swapped out because, you know, you, you may not, you're not really maybe going back reading those old, older things, right? So in addition to just like the, the you know, whether you, you, you bar from the left or bar the right, there's a bunch of other design decisions you have to make in your, in your database system when you build your B plus tree that I sort of want to cover, cover real quickly. So the first thing is, uh, what should be the threshold of deciding that you need, you need to merge, right? Split sort of has to happen because you, you're out of space. You can have overflow pages, uh, some systems do that, but usually what happens is they end up tweaking the, the merge threshold. So in this, in this tutorial uh, on, on the visualization tool, right, it does the, it does the, the merging as soon as you, you hit that less than halfway point. Um, but it may be the case that you don't want to do that right away because say if your application is inserting, deleting, inserting, deleting, right, the same key back and forth over and over again, then that means every time you insert it or uh, every time you delete it, you'll have to do a merge. Every time you insert it again, you'll do a split, right? And th the index is just sort of churning and doing all this extra work. So a lot of times they will actually maybe delay the actual, uh, the actual merging process until some downtime or until the, 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 the administrator says do, to, you know, rebuild my indexes or something like that. Typically what you also see, you know, uh, we won't talk about this too much, but the DBAs often will rebuild their indexes and that means basically just, just building a whole other index that's sort of nicely packed together, right? Uh, and they, for, if you have a you know, big database, it's, it take a long time. So a lot of times when you see you know, websites, like especially banks, that say that they're down at like 3 a.m. on a Sunday, they're often rebuilding their indexes um, and they're sort of optimizing it so that, you know, the next time you do an insert or delete, you don't immediately, you know, do a, do a split or merge. So again, you, the, basically the way to think about this is that you maybe let it be maybe one less than halfway full because then you don't have to reorganize immediately right away. You may, you may, you, there may be something else that gets inserted afterwards that, that'll be able to handle that. So it won't be perfectly balanced, but in practice it's good enough. The next thing we have to deal with is how do we handle non-unique indexes? So we talked about this for hash tables, uh, and it's essentially the same ideas in, in, in a B plus tree. So your two choices are to just interleave the, the, the duplicate key, keys inside the page multiple times, or you can have a pointer to some you know, unique value list. Right? So it sort of looked like this in, in, a, in, a, in your leaf node, Right, we have the key key one repeated multiple times, and then each offset points to the the corresponding value. Or you can do it like this, where each key now points to some special array in your page, where you have all the the values that correspond to that key. Right, and that means again, there's some extra metadata you need to know to say how many entries you have in your uh, for each value list, and so you know how to jump to that offset inside the page to see you know to get to the beginning to find the thing that you're looking for. I would probably say that the, 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 the duplicate key, this approach here, is probably the most common than, than this one here. All right, the next thing we have to deal with are variable length keys. So the first way to do this is essentially to store a pointer inside of the, inside of the, uh, the, the leaf node to the actual value of the key. So instead of packing the key in the leaf page, you have a just the value to the pointer to the tuple. So that means in order to read the key, you gotta go jump to the tuple and jump to the offset where that, where that entry is for that column, and then there you can find the actual value. So this particular approach uh, is actually very rare. I can't think of any database that actually does this. Um, people tried this for in-memory databases in the 1980s and 1990s, but pe typically people don't do this anymore, right? You always want to keep the actual key value, the key contents themselves inside the page where the, where the 
of, of the index. Then you have variable length nodes. Uh, but as we talked about before, that's actually really tricky to do now in your buffer pool manager because now you may have frag fragmentation or may have holes uh, because the different nodes are, or different pages are going to be different sizes. Right? And it makes it hard to reuse pages. And probably the most common thing is that you just embed an array of pointers inside the node itself uh, for these, these variable length values. Right? Sort of like an extra data storage where you have the actual the, the, the contents of the keys. The next thing we, we can talk about do is dealing, if you have really large, large keys though, is what's called prefix compression. And so the way to sort of think about this, because again, the B plus tree doesn't actually have to store the real, or keys that actually exist in your table in the inner nodes, right? If, if a key gets deleted, it may still exist in, in the upper nodes of the tree. Uh, and so that means that the, for the inner nodes, we don't actually maybe need to store the entire key every single time, right, in, in, in its entirety. It may be enough for us to actually just to store a prefix of it, and that's enough for us to direct traffic to say, you go to the left, you go to the right. So let's say I have this, this, this example here. I have two, you know, I, I have two really long strings, and those, those are my keys. Um, and, but if you see that, you know, right away, you know, the first one starts with ABC, the sec second one starts with LMNO, Right? They're already distinct enough uh, where I don't need to worry about you know, maybe looking at all the characters to do my comparison. So instead what I'll do is just store the prefix of them. And again, that's enough for us to figure out whether we want to go left or right. So this is actually very common you see in database systems. It's called prefix compression. Um, and then this is something the database system will do for you automatically if they support this. Um, and again, when you have to then restructure your, your index when there's a, uh, you know, a split because of an insert, then you may have to expand out the, the number of characters you're storing in, in your prefix. Yes? What if the, the, the key you are comparing have the same prefix to the key on the So your question is, what if, what if you have the exact same prefix? Yes. So, all right, so in this case here, say I, I have something that is a, A, B, C, D, E, whatever, right? And the prefix matches. What should happen? You do the comparison of the first prefix, and you're less than equal to that, so then you know you need to go here, right? The first three characters of the thing I'm looking up on will definitely be less than LMNO or LMN, right? So I know I, I need to always go to that side. Now, when I want to see I have an exact match, in the leaf nodes, I have to store the full key, right? This is only for the inner nodes. And we can get away with this in a B plus tree because the full key, to, like the, the, the keys in the inner node don't have to be, you know, exactly as they exist in, in, the, in, the, in the actual table. So you, you always have to store the full key in the, in the leaf node. You don't have to store the full key in the, in the inner node. Yes? Does that only really make sense when you have variable length keys? This question is, does this only make sense when you have variable length keys? Uh, Yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so if, if, you're, if you're trying to keep it word aligned, uh, you know, your 32 bits or 64 bits, then yes, you, 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 you're going to pad it out anyway to keep, to keep it nicely aligned. Yes, this is only matters if you have large variable length keys. Quite, okay. All right, the next thing to talk about with B plus trees is actually do, to do bulk inserts. So it's very common that you see uh, in certain scenarios where someone comes along with an existing data set like my emails that I, that I showed last class, and I want to just bulk load and insert them into, into my table, right? The, you could just follow the normal insert uh, operation protocol that we defined earlier, um, where you sort of build the, the, the index going from the top down, but in actuality what you want to do is actually build the index from, from the bottom up. So what you want to do is pre-sort the, the keys you want to insert, and then you just demarcate the, the leaf nodes along the keys, and then you build up the, the index, the, the rest of the inner nodes, right? So let's say I want, to, I want to insert all these indexes, or all these keys into a single index. The first step, I'll just sort them. Then I'll just create my, my, my leaf nodes. In this case here, I'm always leaving an extra, extra slot o open, but in practice, you could just keep these all uh, tightly packed. I could put you know, six here, and then have seven, uh, 7, 9, and, and 13 together, like that, right? Uh, 
th this is just for visualization. But then again, then now once you have the, the now you know your boundaries, and then you just build the build the rest of the inner nodes on top. So when you call rebuild index or optimize index in certain database systems, you'll get uh, this is essentially what they're doing. They're essentially just re re reading along the leaf nodes because it's already in sorted order, and then building your index that way. Okay, so. Uh, so, that, so that's everything I think you, basic you need to know for B plus trees. Again, the textbook sort of will, will, will cover these operations again. Um, and then for the, the, the homework for that's, that is due next week, we ask you some basic things with uh, for B plus trees. But then in the project, we'll actually, you actually implement your, your, your own B plus tree. And you'll have to do the splitting and merging. All right, so in the remaining time, now I want to talk about skip lists and talk about radix trees. So, a quick and easy observation to think about this, about an index, is that it's the, sort of the easiest way to build what I call a dynamic index, meaning if I need to allow it to have inserts and deletes uh, when I want to preserve the order, it's just to build a, a linked list. Because right? now it's really easy to insert something because I just jumped to one location and I only have to update one pointer, right? assuming we're running in a single direction. Right? The problem with this, though, is that uh, um, we have to do a linear search. That's actually not true. It should be a binary search. Um, assuming it's not in sort of order, then you have to do a linear search. Uh, and but a binary search is what it's essentially doing is sort of allowing you to jump over different different parts of the index. So rather than if I if I want to do a scan now to find all my entries, rather than sort of starting from here, jumping to there, jumping to there, if I had a little extra pointer to know how to jump over the next entry then I don't even have to bother looking at, at, at this key here. And so you can sort of extend this and keep going up, up and up and have larger, larger number, numbers of jumps. Right? This is sort of essentially what, what the B plus tree is doing, but this is sort of another way to think about it. So this is what a, essentially a skip list does. A skip list is going to be a multi-level linked list that's going to have extra entries that allow you to jump over intermediate nodes. So it was first developed or invented in 1990 by a professor at University of Maryland. Um, it does now actually show up in a couple of different database systems. So the most famous skip list database system is probably MemSQL. Like they, MemSQL doesn't use a P plus tree. They use a skip list as, as its main uh, you know, in, index, index data structure. But it's also used in WireTiger, which is the, the database engine that MongoDB bought. And Facebook's RocksDB, it's used again for sort of internal metadata about things that it's stored. But most systems actually, most database systems don't actually use skip lists for the table indexes. Only MemSQL is the, the, the one that does this that I know about. <coughs> so the way to think about this is then again, it's, it's multiple levels of a linked list. And then the, at the lowest level, it's just again sorted in single direction. And then in the second level, you skip every other key. And then the third level, you skip every, every, every third key and fourth key and so forth, right? But what's going to happen is when you do an insert, uh, instead of always, you know, you have to decide whether you want to add an entry uh, in these upper levels, they, it's, you just flip a coin and then randomly decide whether to include entry or not. So skip lists are called uh, you know, probabilistic data structures or random data structures because unlike a B plus tree where you're guaranteed, if you, if you follow the protocol, that every lookup will be log n. Um, in a skip list, you're not guaranteed that, but in practice, it always is. Right? So let's look at an example here. So first is that we have our, our sort of level guideposts. And again, the, the P here stands for what's the probability that for a given key, it'll have an entry at this level. So at the very bottom, the, the probability is 1, because you always have to have every, every entry. Then above that, it's, it's 50%, and then above that, it's 25%, right? And so you, again, you see that within the bottom level, everything's sorted. And then the second level, we have every other entry. And then they have a pointer to either the, the next entry at this level or the entry that exists below it. And so this is sort of like a B tree where you can't have a key in an upper level if it doesn't exist at the lowest level. Right, when you do a delete, you have to knock out what's called the tower. You, you have to take out the entire tower. Right? And the top here, at this point, we don't have, we've never inserted anything that got to the top level. And so it just has a pointer to some null bit to say that there's, there's nothing here that, that to find. There's no entry. So let's see how uh, we would insert a key. Right? We want to insert a key 5. 
So again, we flip a coin, and then we decide uh, how many levels we want to insert it. So let's say we flip a coin, and we end up with the third level. So we need to put entries here at, at all, these, of all these locations. So we end up writing the, to the first one first, and then we write the second one, and then and the, and the last one, and we have the pointers all the way down. All right? So I'm not describing how to do this concurrently. Uh, just take my word for it. There's a way to actually make sure that you don't do this without anybody seeing uh, a key that shouldn't exist. Yes? His question is, when you flip a coin, how do you decide uh, what? Sorry, I, I mean, look, all right. Uh, actually, no, no, hold on, hold on. So, so you always land here, right? Then you go to the next level, flip a coin. If it's heads, you add it. If tails, you stop, right? So if you get heads, you add it. Then you go to the next level, flip another coin, right? Yes. So, 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 right, so you always add it here, then you get to the next one, get heads or one again, so you keep adding it, right? And then, yes, in theory, right, you could infinitely get, you know, nonstop ones, right? If you have those odds, go to, go to Vegas, right? Probably, probabilistically, you're not going to get that, so that's fine, right? Okay, so, uh, all right, now, now we, we install all our pointers, and now if anybody does a look up here, they, 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 they'll find key five, right? Key five is fully established in, in, in our index now. All right, so now let's say I want to do a look up on key three, right? You always start at the very top tower, right, at the top level, and you would say, you would look, peek down to what the, the level pointer is pointing at. It points to key five, but you know key three is less than key five, so you don't, you don't want to traverse along this. You jump down to the next level. Now you see here, key three is greater than key two, so you know you want to jump, jump to here and then continue along the level. You keep going until you find a key at the current level you're at that is greater than the value that you're looking for. So in this case here, key three is less than key four, so you know you can't go that way, right? You have to go down, right? And then you f come along until you find key three, the thing you were looking for. Yes? Okay, so, so, so his question is, why does this have to be a, 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 a probabilistic data structure? So there is a, uh, there is a implementation of skip lists called deterministic skip lists that do exactly as you described. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that would make sense for like a bulk insert. Yeah, yes. Insert, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff I'm glossing over here, but like, the, the, to basically understand that like, you, know, you have these levels and you, you randomly, in quotes, decide whether to, to, add, a, to add entry. In the back. What's the advantage of randomness? What is the advantage of randomness? Uh, so the question, yeah, so the advantage of the randomness is here that like you end up having to store less data than in a B plus tree, right? Because a B plus tree, you always have to have exactly, uh, you know, all, filled in all the, the guideposts you need at all the inner nodes, right? There's oh, those keys here. In this case here, you're allowed to have possibly you think of it at a level where you don't have any entry. And that makes the scan be slower, but in practice it's, it's, it turns out okay. The way to sort of think about this, and I should have showed a picture, is that a skip list is essentially just a rotated B plus tree. That's not perfectly balanced. I think also you have to maintain a sort of like variant if you're right now. Correct, yeah so, it's, yeah, so, yeah. so the other issue is that I don't have to do any splits, I don't have to do any merges, right? If I insert an entry, uh, all I have to do is just update all these pointers. I don't have to go rebalance everything, right? All right, so now to do a delete. Uh, again, I'm going to do this at a high level, but let's just say that you just set a flag in, in the node to say that the, the entry has been deleted. So if anybody scans along and, tries to, and, try, and sees that entry, uh, it, it knows that it shouldn't, shouldn't be able to see it, and it just ignores it. And at some later point, we'll come by and do garbage collection to, to, to clean up the space. Once we know no thread is pointing at it. Right? So let's say I delete K5. Right? All the entries now have this delete flag that will initially set to false. And then we do our lookup to find K5, set the flag to true. So now if anybody scans along and, find, and look, finds K5, 
they know K5 shouldn't be there, so they ignore it. Um, and then we can come along and then start cleaning up all our pointers uh, to route around K5. And at this point here, if we know that no thread is looking at it, then it's safe for us to delete it. Okay, so the, again, related to his, sort of related to his questions, the, the, the main advantages of a skip list over a B plus tree, or sort of what I call a typical B plus tree, is that you don't want to have, uh, you don't want to always have every single key, and in this particular example of the skip list, you don't have pointers in the reverse direction. That makes it hard to do scans in the reverse direction, it requires you to do extra work, but for our purposes, we don't care about that. And again, any insertion and deletion doesn't, doesn't require rebalancing. Right? It's always going to be, you know, a, a, a straightforward operation. Now, the downside of a skip list, and why you don't see them that often, is that these are data structures that are optimized for being in memory. Now, there's a paged version of a skip list where you pack multiple things in a page, and then it really starts to, to smell like a B plus tree, right? Uh, so you don't really get that much benefit. The random number generator can be expensive, depending on how you, you implement it. And then if you, have, since you don't have pointers in the reverse direction, uh, scanning in the reverse direction is expensive. So we're not going to cover, you know, this is also you need, really need to know about a skip list to do the homework. In the advanced class, we'll talk about how you, how you build a high performance skip list uh, using compare and swap instructions where you don't have to maintain latches on, on nodes in order to update those pointers. And this is sort of why the MemSQL guys chose to use this, because latch-free or lock-free data structures were, um, people think that in general that they're, 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 they're much better than a sort of standard latching data structure. Actually, but in practice, the research showed that's not true either. Okay. So now the last index I want to show you guys, the tree data structure, is completely different than, than all the other ones, right? And the main difference is that in the skip list and the B plus tree, when I do a key comparison, as I'm traversing the index, I'm doing a whole comparison. Yes, I talked about the prefix where you can sort of only have to do compare part of it, uh, but in general, when you get down to the bottom, you're now doing a full comparison of the key. And if it's integers, that's not a big deal because you can do that in a single instruction on the CPU. If they're strings, then that's a more, more expensive operation, right? It requires mul multiple instructions. And so a radex tree, differs in that rather than storing the, the, the entire key at every single level of the tree, you're actually going to only store one digit of it. And by digit, I just mean like either a single bit or if it's a string, a single character, right? One element, uh, atomic element of it. And so what will happen is, it's very interesting about this, is that the height of the tree actually doesn't depend on the number of entries you have anymore. It actually depends on the, the length of the keys and the contents of the keys, right? And like a skip list, it's not going to require any rebalancing, and the way you want to reconstruct the key is actually defined by the path you take as you search into uh, the index. So who, who here knows what a try is? One, two, a few, okay, good. Uh, who here knows, knows what a Patricia tree is? Nobody. Who, who here knows what a radix tree is? No one, okay. So radix tree is another name for Patricia tree, right? But a try is this. So a try is basically, the way to think about it is that you're taking the keys, again, you're splitting up all the elements, and that's what you're going to store at, at each, each level, node level, right? So say you take the key hello, then you see I have H-E-L-L-O, right, all the way down, and then I have my pointer to either, again, the record or the actual tuple data itself. So if I want to see whether I have the key hello, I first take H. Do I have H? Yes, I go down. Then I do a comparison, say, for the ne ne next one is E. I go, go to the left, then LLO, going down. This is all a try is, right? So a radix tree, the main difference is that instead of storing a, a separate node for every single element in your, you know, in your key, you, uh, right, whatever, have and hat, right? You actually pack them together when you know you don't have any overlap with other keys in your index. So in the case of H-E-L-L-O, hello, I only have three keys. There's no other key that has E-L-L-O. So rather than storing individual nodes, I only have a single node with E-L-L-O. So now to do my lookup to see whether this key exists, I don't have to traverse 
uh, the tree, I just do the comparison with the remaining part of, of, the, of the suffix of the tree. In the case of ha hat and have, they overlap on H and A, but they differ on V, E, and T, so therefore I have separate nodes for those. Yes? So if uh, that means that uh, the Redis tree is always a binary tree. This question is, is the Radix tree always a binary tree? No. But then, if that's the case, then why, we, why, we don't, why don't we have three ch children on the latch? We have A, B, and uh, Wait, so, so, sorry, what, we have the H node here. Yeah, and then we have three ch children. Why would you have three children, right? Because the next key is A, and H, A from hat, H, A from have overlap. If you added, like, another, uh, key that, that started H-E-I, then you, you have a third entry. Question in the back? Yes? The question is, with this what, sorry? Yes, yeah, so his question is, do you have to do splits and radix trees? Yes. Your statement is, would it be tedious, though? Uh, yeah, it's just, you know, I'll, I'll show you the next slide. Um, how do I say this? Uh, slightly more expensive, but not that big of a deal. Yeah, it's, it's in memory, so. Another question? Yeah. Correct, yes, it's, it's, it's a generalized, it's an optimization, yes. But it's called a radix tree. Or a, or a partition tree. Yeah, psh, don't look at me, right? I don't know. Uh, all right, so the, again, H-E-L-O, and then we overlap there. So, so there's one particular uh, implementation of a radix tree called, um, called uh, ART from the hyper database management system. Uh, and it sort of looks like this. At the different levels, you try to pack together uh, in a single node. You pack together all the keys that correspond to that level. Um, and then you say you want to insert hair, right? You just you don't have to create a new node, you just have a little extra space where you can pack this guy in over there, right? And if I want to delete hat and have, then I find the entries I want to delete, and I recognize that this guy basically is hanging out by himself, there's nothing else here, so I can go ahead and move uh, IR up above and pack it in the node there, right? So yes, you have to do splitting and merging, but it's tedious is not the word I would use to describe it, right? It's not, you don't have to do a brute force to figure it out. Yes? Say it again? Her question is, does this work well for range queries? Uh, yes, because it's in sort of order. Right? Oh, no, actually, in this example, it's not, but it should be. Yes? Yes? <laughs> So his question is, and for hello, if for that particular one key, if, there, if the, last character. the last character is different? Basically, if what? So if it's just hell? Oh, I mean, oh, so if you insert a new key, say you insert hell, H-E-L-L, -L, right? Then you would split the hello and put and have one have one um, one pointer to the value of the record for the, for hell. And then another record that would point to the O for hello, right? You would split it that way. Uh, e L E L L would be in one node, right? And then the O would be in, a, in a, another level below it, because there's a distinct key that has the O in it, so you have to have a, a demarcation in the, in, in the index to say that there's, that there's an element for that. Okay? Yes? I think it was more asking about where you sort that. Was it on that level of ELL or was it on a level of ELL? Uh, I mean, you, you, would, you would pack that in the same node. I, I'm not, sh no, not really showing memory layout here too much. I feel like there's a, there's a much simpler way where you just allow an epsilon character and say, okay, 
Uh, let's take a little offline. We, we talk about what they do in hyper. Okay. So the, the tricky thing, though, about radix trees is how you actually do your comparison. Right? Because I sort of showed simple examples here. We have a bunch of, you know, characters in a string, and it's straightforward to read them in, from left to right, as we do read in English, to, to, to map them down in our, uh, in our index. But for other types that we want to store in our index, uh, we have a problem because, you know, if you're running on Intel, it's a little Indian, and the, and the bits are in reverse order. And then if you have signed integers, you have, you know, you have the two bits at the, at the top that are, that are telling you whether it's negative or not, right? So you have to do some extra work uh, that, I'm, that I'm describing here to actually be able to store any arbitrary value in a, in, in a radix tree, right? It's not like a, uh, in the B plus tree or the skip list, you just take the two keys and you do your comparison directly on them. Now you need to make sure that you're walking through the digits in the correct order. So let's look through an example here. So let's say we want to store this integer key like this, right? And if we want to represent it as a, as a hexadecimal number, uh, we would have these four, four digits. And then depending on whether we're big endian or little endian, we may end up with uh, different ordering, right? So in this case here, if I'm storing things in, uh, in little endian and I would do my comparison, it may not actually end up being the, the, the correct thing that I'm looking for. So I want to reverse it so that I'm always looking at, you know, starting at the, in the, the Arabic numeral, starting at the 1, then followed by the 6, followed by the 8. Right? Because if you go in the other direction, you, you may end up get, getting an incorrect result when you do your comparison. So in practice, database systems that use radix trees you have to do this extra step when you put keys in and when you do probes and searches to make sure that it's always being read in, in the correct order for the digits. Okay? So just to finish up real quickly, uh, this is actually from a paper we published in Sigma last year that was run by a PhD student here at CMU where we did a comparison of a sort of state-of-the-art B plus tree uh, a skip list and the radix tree from the hyper database system. And we're also throwing in here a mass tree and a BW tree. We'll cover that in the advanced class. Just sort of think of these as being uh, highly tuned in memory databases. So none of this is on disk, all of this is in memory. So the main thing I want to show you here is that the, the radix tree is crushing everything. And this is because it's really, really fast to do comparisons because you're looking at those single digits. So if you're not doing any inserts, you're not doing any updates, you're not you know, doing splits and merges, it's super fast to do that digit comparison to see whether the key you're looking for is there, right? But lo and behold, our, our the, you know, the B plus tree from the 1970s still holds its own and actually outperforms the, in some cases, the, the, the actually this, this slide, no. But in practice, we have other experiments to show the B plus tree can actually be, beat the skip list. Yes? I'm wondering how these things So his question is, uh, why should you throw these in the same graph? Because they're optimized for disk versus optimized memory? Well, basically, I'm saying that they're using different versions of them. So, no, so I would say uh, all of these are designed to be in-memory indexes. Uh, so the simplest thing to think about this is in the case of a B plus tree, instead of having have a 4K page, because that's the page size on disk, uh, for, for a node, you have like 512 bytes. Because that fits, fits in a cache line. All right, that's the main difference. Yeah, the graph will look, yes, he's right. The graph will, and I mean, it depends on the workload, uh, depends on, yes, how we organize things. Right? In practice, the skip list going out the disk, if, you ha if you're not packing things in a page, if you're going to get a single disk, you know, disk read for every single node you read along the bottom, then that's going to be really, really slow. So, yeah, so there's a lot, lot to discuss. Um, well, again, we'll cover this in the advanced class. All right, I have uh, two minutes. So, real quick, um, all right, so I want to show you some extra things you can do with indexes that the book doesn't cover, but I think are actually useful in practice. So the first, you can, call, you can create what are called partial indexes, where when you create your index, you can specify a where clause to actually do filtering of elements before you put it into the index. So in this case here, say I have a table on foo, and I'm building an index on A and B, but I add a where clause to say only include tuples 
only include tuples, only include values for A and B for tuples that match my predicate where C equals Wu-Tang. So now if I come along and I have a query like this, right, where I have and C equals Wu-Tang, then the data system knows that I can just use that index I defined above and I can find the things I'm looking for. And the reason why you do this is because now our index has less data in it and it probably can fit entirely in main memory and it'll be really, really fast to do this. So most, uh, most commercial data systems and, my, and Postgres can do this. Uh, I don't know if MySQL and SQLite can do this. Then you can have what are called covering indexes. So covering indexes I, is not something you actually specify in your index. It's just something the data system, you sort of get if the data system can do this and support this operation. Basically what a covering index is, is, is occurs when all of the attributes needed for the query can be found in the index. So in this case here, I'm doing a lookup on foo, getting to select on B and doing a lookup on A. So I have A and B in my index. So I can do my probe my index, find the, the data that I need, and then that's all I need to compute the answer. You never have to go back to the actual tuples to, to, to see what the values of A and B are because they're all packed in the index. So this is, this is great if you can do this, but it may be the case that there are other attributes that you want to include in your query that you don't, don't want to index on. So you, and for these, you can have what are called include, include columns. So what happens now is that I still have my index on A and B, but I'm telling the database system to also pack in my, my leaf nodes the values of the tuple of attribute C for every single tuple that I'm indexing. So now when I do my, my lookup, I get A and B from the index, but then if I want to see whether the contents of C equals Wu-Tang, then I just look at the, the include column that's packed in, in the, the leaf node itself, and again, I never have to go look at the, look at the actual underlying tuple data. Everything I need is stored, stored together. So this, is not, th this particular trick is not that common. Uh, I know SQL Server supports this, and maybe DB2 and Oracle, but I know Postgres and MySQL can't do this, right? And again, the idea here is that we want to maximize the, the amount of data we can get from an index without having have to go to disk and look at the actual tuple, tuples themselves. Okay, so to finish up, uh, the B plus tree is always going to be a good choice for your index in, in your database management system. Uh, people come along with various different data structures and things like that. The B, the B plus tree is, is always very, very good. Uh, and skip list and radix trees have some interesting properties. They have some downsides that make them not sort of maybe useful in practice as the primary index to use for a uh, disk-based data management system. But for in-memory systems, it, it, uh, you may want to choose these. And then We'll cover how to build lock-free data structures and talk more about concurrency control inside of indexes in the advanced class in the spring. All right, so next class on Monday, we'll start talking about actually how to use all the things we've talked about so far to actually start processing queries, right? We can organize in indexes. We can organize things on disks. Now we're going to start going up the stack further and say, all right, a SQL query comes in and we generate a query plan. How do we actually start crunching the data and compute answers? Okay? Any questions, concerns, or problems? All right, guys. See you on Monday. <laughs>